You know, sometimes in America's 200 plus year history, it has required a fresh set of eyes visiting from distant lands to help us see ourselves more accurately. The best example probably is in the 1830s when a French nobleman, Alexis de Tocqueville, came here originally to investigate America's prison system. His mandate or his investigative purview expanded as he got here. He became fascinated with what it was that had made this nation on the edge of a wilderness so dynamic, even in barely its first half century under the U.S. Constitution. And he ultimately wrote the classic democracy in America. Our guest this evening, Nick Adams from Australia, has been likened to Tocqueville. He came here at just the age of 24 after a lifelong impulsion to know more about America and to help Americans know more about ourselves through the mirror that he might be able to hold up, even as a young man. Nick had already by this time been elected to local government office as a university undergraduate in his metropolis home of Sydney, the suburban community of Ashford. He was just 19. He was in local government on the council. At age 21, he was deputy mayor. He served throughout the years of his 20s, but he came here, was fascinated with this country, began studying America and speaking to Americans about how admired we are and our country's ideals are to the corners of the earth. The result, among other things, was this book called American Boomerang, How the World's Greatest Turnaround Nation Will Do It Again. We are delighted to have Nick Adams with us at Western Conservative Summit this past July. Lots of you were there when he lit the room up on Sunday morning moderating a panel about what we can expect as millennials take positions of leadership. I'm especially glad that we've got a lot of CCU students with us this evening because students, this gentleman just turned 30 a few weeks ago. He sets an example of what in an open society like America or his own Australia, what you can do without having a whole lot of years under your belt. If you have the vision, the determination, the drive. Today's Alexis de Tocqueville. He's working on a French accent. You'll have to get by with the one that he brought with him for now. We're just delighted to welcome back to CCU and Centennial Institute, Nick Adams of Australia. Good evening, Mr. Andrews, distinguished guests, staff and students at the Colorado Christian University and members of the public both here tonight and those watching at home on C-SPAN. It is a pleasure to be back in Denver. I am very grateful for the Centennial Institute's kind invitation for me to be here with you this evening. John Andrews, the director of the Centennial Institute, deserves special mention. I thank him for his friendship, his mentoring, his patience and his loyalty in both good and trying times. It would be remiss of me not to mention Kerry Brem, John's assistant, who has been pivotal in ensuring that I can be here with you tonight. Her warm spirit, her meticulous nature and her indefatigable work ethic make her a delight to work with. Ladies and gentlemen, it is so good to be in Colorado. In my experience, it's a great state. Beautiful one day, absolutely perfect the next. <laughs> Growing up as a child, I had this insatiable curiosity. So I would flip through travel guides in the library at school or in bookstores in the city. And whenever I got a travel guide of America, invariably I'd come across the great state of Colorado. And without fail, always one of the first things that would be listed about Colorado is that it is the highest state in the Union. Little did I know that by the time I would make it to Colorado, that would come to have taken on, shall we say, enhanced meaning. 
I still remember vividly my very first encounter, real encounter, with Colorado. It was on my first trip to the United States and I was in the San Francisco of Texas, uh, behind enemy lines, in the People's Republic of Austin. <laughs> now, for those of you that haven't been to Austin, let me tell you that there is so much to choose from. You've got the soft left, the centre left, and the crazy out of it left. In fact, it's what the left like to call diversity. <laughs> anyway, here I was in sweltering conditions in the middle of summer, meandering down 6th Street, perspiring profusely as perhaps President Obama might on the golf course. <laughs> My throat's parched and I'm looking for a drink. What happens? I stumble across this odd looking fellow and right next to him is this gigantic bucket of ice full of bottles of beer. No water, I inquire. No, he says, but hey, beer's only $2. I said, okay. Now you've got to understand as an Australian, the last thing an Australian wants to do is drink a warm beer. So I know that there was ice there, but I didn't know how long the beer had been inside. So I said, okay, sir, but are the beers cold or did you just put them in? Well, as quick as the speed of light, with the reflexes of a Giselle, he's plunged his arm into the bucket and yanked out almost professionally in one deft move a bottle of beer. Are they cold? He bellows at me. He says, Bubba, I'm going to teach you something. You see, this here is what we call a Coors Light. When the Rockies are blue, you know it's cold. You don't have to ask. And needless to say, following this most serendipitous encounter, and after learning of the political persuasion and the donation habits of the Coors family, Coors very rapidly became my favourite American adult beverage. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm looking forward to uh, telling you a little bit about my story, but can I just say I was in Colorado just five months ago taking stage at the Western Conservative Summit and uh, back then you had a Democratic Senator and now you have a Republican Senator. <laughs> now I don't know how much I had to do with that but I'm hoping that there's a message in there and I'll be able to come to Colorado more often if that's the result. <laughs> As an intellectually curious person, but with a very rudimentary knowledge of Spanish, I was very interested to learn that Colorado is actually the Spanish word for red. So I, for one, was very glad that etymology and political climate have once more aligned. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my connection to America is ideological, intellectual, emotional and historical. Ideological because I love the idea and the values that America represents. Intellectual because my study of America is considered somewhat formal and perspectival. Emotional because even though I wasn't born in America, even though I don't live in America, I feel American. And historical because were it not for America, I'd probably be delivering this speech in Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud to be a Christian. I'm proud to have faith. I'm proud to believe in something bigger than me. That's what America has always been about. America has shown and demonstrated that Christian civilization, when lived out in the lives of individuals and institutions, brings about the greatest degree of liberty, prosperity, creativity, individuality, optimism, success and peace. But more on that later. Let me tell you a little bit more about who I am. I was born in Sydney, Australia on the 5th of September 1984 and I was born to a German mother and an Australian father with Greek heritage. The greatest trial of my life came at just 16 months 
when I was diagnosed with neuroblastoma, which is a very rare and unusual childhood cancer. Only one in 100,000 children get neuroblastoma. There are only 600 cases a year in America and just 40 in Australia. And the thing with neuroblastoma is it is an enormously difficult cancer to diagnose. And that means that overwhelmingly when neuroblastoma is diagnosed, the tumour will have spread to other parts of the body. When I was diagnosed with neuroblastoma, I was diagnosed with stage four neuroblastoma. The cancer had spread throughout my body. My entire body was riddled with cancer. And my mother and father were told that I had just a 5% chance of survival, of life. And after almost three years of chemotherapy, radiotherapy and an operation, through the healing hands of our master physician God, I defied the odds and I lived. And it would be a battle that would forever shape who I was and the way I conducted my life. It explains why I aggressively pursue every option, every possibility and every single dream. I wish I could tell you that I inherited my mother's German punctuality and organisational skills, but I'd be lying. I did, however, learn from her several very valuable lessons about life, chief among those the need to protect and look after those who are incapable or less able to fend for themselves. Some of my earliest memories involve walking around the bay where we lived to go and feed the seagulls. And my mother would always make a point of observing a seagull that was injured or just on one leg or in some way hampered from being able to compete for the breadcrumbs that we would offer the flock of seagulls that would come and she would always keep a little few breadcrumbs just in reserve so that once the entire flock had dispersed, having been fed, we could get up as close as we could to the injured seagull and make sure that they didn't go without. And it's a very simple story and a simple analogy, but it's one that I've always tried to remember and I've always tried to live by. From my father, I inherited my confidence, my resilience, my passion and my audacity. Looking back, although it was never explained to me in this way, he taught me the spirit of philotimo, which is the Greek idea of honour and doing the right thing, even when one's own interests or even one's own life is in peril. Growing up, while I never felt anything but Australian, there were two stories about the Second World War and Greece that I always kept close to my heart. The first was in 1940, when Benito Mussolini, Italy's, Italy's Prime Minister, asked the Greek Prime Minister, Metaxa, for free passage through Greece. And on the spot, at three o'clock in the morning, without hesitation, without consultation, he said, Oi! He said, No. It was a spirited defiance and quite incredible when considering just how vastly outnumbered the Greeks were by the Italians. It prompted Sir Winston Churchill, the greatest figure of the 20th century in my mind, to say, it is not Greeks that fight like heroes, but that heroes fight like Greeks. And then again in 1943, on the island of Zakynthos, the German military commander ordered the bishop and the mayor to prepare him a list of the Jewish community on the island. His plan was to deport the entire Jewish community of Zakynthos to concentration camps in Poland. The word had gone out that any Greek caught hiding a Jew would be executed on the spot. Instead of preparing this list, the bishop and the mayor went to the Jewish community on the island and they sent them into hiding in the mountains or with Christian friends in the countryside. They returned to the German military commander 
and presented him with a sheet of paper, the list that the German military commander was after. There were just two names on that piece of paper, the bishop and the mayor. They told the German military commander that it was the entire Jewish community of Zakynthos. It was the spirit of Philotimo that was behind both of those acts. And it is that precise spirit that has encouraged me to answer what I consider the greatest moral calling of our time, the defence of the United States of America. As a 17-year-old, I watched as evil Islamists plunged planes <coughs> into buildings. I remember realising then and there that history had bestowed a very particular role upon my generation to stand up and to fight for America. At university, I watched as American flag after American flag was burned. As an adult, I watched as the world's media turned anti-Americanism into a sport. I watched as they opposed every single American military endeavour, always attributing it to some nefarious motive. I saw their contempt for President George W. Bush and I see their admiration for President Barack Obama, a moral inversion, if I've ever seen one. I've watched the left undermine the pillars of Americanism, liberty, small government, God-based ethics, and e pluribus unum, through schools and universities, labour unions, the entertainment media, and the arts. I don't want to think about a world devoid of American leadership. It terrifies me. It frightens me. We've already seen glimpses of what it looks like under this president. And it is indeed very grave. Right now, America must save its children from humanism, its economy from deprivation, and its liberty from extinction. Abandoning American roots means that you lose all the attending benefits of Christian civilization, such as absolute moral standards, a sound economy, and any vestige of liberty that you still maintain. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that being born an American is to have won the lottery of life. Hundreds of millions of people right around the world wish they could live in America more than their own country. More people from more countries have immigrated to America to be free than the rest of the world's countries put together. There is no place like America. But America's not just a place, America's not just a country. It's the greatest value system ever devised. The world should adopt American values. American values are the world's best hope. Amen. Everything that I am saying violates violently left-wing orthodoxy. But why be politically correct when you can be right? <laughs> why not speak the truth when you can be patriotic? Nothing is more anti-American in ideology or in practice than political correctness. Absolutely nothing. Every problem in America today can be traced back to it. Every challenge America faces is compounded by it. Every threat to America today is enhanced by it. Political correctness, when allowed to flourish, extinguishes confidence, impairs judgment, preaches victimhood and entrenches division. It makes a peaceful and cooperative society impossible. Who here is familiar with Enid Blyton, the prolific British children's writer? Anyone? Okay, a couple. Fabulous writer. Her work has been translated into over a hundred different languages. Children all around the world. Noddy. Noddy. Children all around the world have read Enid Blyton's books and loved them. 
I couldn't get enough of them. I read them and reread them and reread them scores of times. And I tell you what really infuriates me. A few years ago, a decision was made to take all Enid Blyton books off bookshelves in stores and in libraries with a view to revising and ultimately republishing new editions of Enid Blyton to remove what self-appointed tolerant czars considered racial or gender period bias. So line by line, page by page, Enid Blyton's work was edited to reflect apparently new norms of society. And I remember thinking to myself, who are these people? Who are you? Who are you, some third-rate upstart mediocrity to presume to tell free men and women what they can and cannot read? It's outrageous. But of course, I'm a straight, white, middle-class, conservative, well-educated male. So I don't get a voice. I'm not entitled to an opinion and I need to check my white privilege. Well, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of being told what I can say and what I can't say. I'm tired of being told to be careful. I'm tired of seeing good people hauled over the hot coals for no reason. I'm tired of seeing arbitrary standards set by ponytailed grad students that have spent far too much time in gender studies seminars. <laughs> I, I am tired of the secular Twitter ninnies that hide behind a computer with nothing better in their life to do than act as a lynch mob, dictating our culture and the news cycle to lazy journalists. I'm tired of seeing good people lose opportunities and lose their jobs just because they hold a certain opinion. That's not the America I grew up imagining. That's not the America I spent afternoons gazing out of my classroom window dreaming of. I remember those afternoons very well. Looking outside the classroom window, contemplating life beyond the plush green rugby ovals of my all boys Anglican private school. Invariably my mind would drift to America, this country far away, oozing with opportunity, overflowing with optimism, brimming with creativity, teeming with energy. America, the place where anything, anything, anything at all was possible. Long before I came to America, I was in love with America because I was a dreamer. I had big hopes, big ideas, big visions. I didn't want to be ordinary. I didn't want to be mediocre. I didn't want to settle. I came to America to be the best that I could be, to learn from the best, to be mentored by the best, and to ultimately be able to match it with or even beat the best, to make it. Because if you can make it in America, you can make it anywhere. The best of every industry, no matter what it is, is right here in the United States. All of you in this room are so lucky to be Americans. You live in a culture that is exciting and vibrant and passionate and nostalgic and optimistic. Others live in boring and colourless and vanilla and pedestrian and timid cultures. That's why my advice to you is always to never let anyone tell you that you can't achieve it. Never let anyone stomp on your dreams. Never be content to colour between the lines. Never be cramped into submission. Stretch out and slap mediocrity in the face. Because as Americans, you've been given so much more. Don't lose it. Don't squander it. Don't give in to the tolerance totalitarians and their agenda. Our big dreams will never be satisfied by their small agenda that has already failed. Be bold. 
Be faithful. Lead. Lead. That's what America was meant to do. That's what Americans should do. It's their natural disposition. Leadership is the indispensable quality that America offers the entire world. Let me close with a great passage, a catch cry, first used by Napoleon and later co-opted by the great US General George Patton. You'll need it in a world that is increasingly against you. Audacity, audacity, always audacity. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. God bless you. God bless Colorado. to dinner and I told you you should not have the extra caffeine. I'm just so glad that I cut you down on caffeine tonight. <laughs> Who knows what we would have been in for. Let's go now to your comments and questions. I heard a titter of laughter when Nick referred to a C-SPAN audience as though he was just being grandiose. Who could ever accuse him of being grandiose? No, we're honored that C-SPAN is here. They have occasionally covered events on the campus. They have often covered the Western Conservative Summit. And so I only mention this so that we've got good audio. I'm going to need you, if you have a question or comment, to come up and take the microphone from me. Let the uh, rest of the room hear your question or comment, and then we'll give the mic back to our guest, Nick Adams. And give us your name and give us your question. Dr. Watson, I'm a history professor here. Uh, the world, not America. Um, <laughs> how are we going to turn this thing around? How are we going to undo the damage of the last seven years, six go. years? Well, Doctor, I appreciate that question very much. In my book, The American Boomerang, I actually outline a very simple, concise 10-point plan that I believe will see America return to its full potential. That 10-point plan is to end the waste, to pay back the debt, to limit the government, to axe political correctness, to protect the borders, to preserve Judeo-Christian traditions, to cut taxes, to end the culture of entitlement, keep the peace through unquestioned military advantage, and exercise fidelity to the Constitution. Now, that's a long laundry list. Where do we begin? Well, I believe that if you can do all of those 10 things, you will forge a new generation of Americans capable of securing the American dream for another 200 years at least, and that would be the best thing that could happen not just for America, but for the entire world. To answer your follow-up question about how to do it, it's going to require a patriotic shot in the arm. It's going to require Americans to re-engage in the culture wars. It's going to require Americans to no longer seed the ground of the media, of schools, of universities. We need to take the fight to the left. We need to take the fight to the forces whose ultimate target is the United States of America. Let's be honest, their target list is as long as the list I just provided you. But the grand prize, if there was a deck of cards of the most wanted, America would be the prime card because America represents the greatest holdout to the left's agenda. And it's why we need to do everything that we can do to make sure that America remains strong. Because I believe that the rest of the world is too far gone. And I don't say that lightly, but I believe that the only hope for our world, the only hope for Americans of today to feel safe about the future that they will bequeath to their children and their children is the United States of America. Who else, please? How about a student question? Never saw such a shy audience. He's cowed them all into silence. Thank you, John. My name's Chris Crown. 
your commentary or thoughts or observations on our president's recent recent address to your Congress? It's good to see that the Colorado Christian University audience is very well informed. You're exactly right, sir. President Obama did come and visit Australia recently, and he was there for the G20 summit, which saw Australia as the host, and as host, welcome world leaders from right around the world. President Obama attended the G20 conference, and he spoke at a local university in the state of Queensland where he proceeded to give a nationally televised live address covered on every single channel in Australia. He dedicated a very substantial portion of that speech to climate change. <laughs> now he spoke with reverence, uh, almost as if he was speaking about a faith. Funny that. <laughs> and he told Australians that it's the great moral challenge of our time that we stand up and we fight for climate change. He said that little Sasha and Malia are never going to get to see the Great Barrier Reef. He said that Australians have got more to lose from climate change than anybody else. Now all of this might be fairly unremarkable. Of course we've come to expect this kind of tripe from the leader of the free world. <laughs> but what was incredible about it is that Australia has not subscribed to the climate change apoplexy that the rest of the world has. And one of the central planks of the newly elected Conservative government was to scrap our cap and trade tax or our carbon tax. And we did that. That was an unpopular tax. That was a burdensome tax and everyone wanted it gone. So it went. Now, President Obama knew this full well. And of course, at the G20 summit, because Australia was hosting, it surprised for you that climate change was left off the agenda. Our Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, is one of the most uh, outspoken uh, skeptics, if you like, on climate change. So for President Obama to come down to Australia and proceed to give a speech at a local university in arguably Australia's closest ally, a friendship that goes back so long I don't even know where to begin, uh, was amazing. It emerged in the days following that the US Embassy in Australia had actually advised President Obama against making the speech, fearing that it would provoke a diplomatic row. And boy, did it. For the first time in the relationship, the Foreign Minister of Australia and the Trade Minister had to come out and publicly rebuke the President of the United States. <laughs> and it's, it's quite amazing that the President would choose to line up somebody that is not even a political opponent, but what he deems to be an ideological opponent. And that was disappointing, uh, it was stunning, it was offensive really for him to come and do that. But it follows a tradition of him alienating America's traditional allies. We remember the iPod that he sent the Queen full of his speeches. Uh, we will recall him sending back the bust of Sir Winston Churchill to uh, Westminster. So clearly he has a problem with a lot of America's long-standing allies and his foreign policy seems to be to upset the allies and embolden his enemies, which is to the detriment, again, not just of America, but the entire world. Thanks, Nick. Who else? My name is Ellen Densmore. I'm a political science major here. And I love America, so I really appreciate you coming out to talk to us. Um, your words tonight have been really encouraging to me. However, of late I've begun to consider some darker possibilities. What if America doesn't pull out of the slump that we're seeing currently? My initial question would have been that of Dr. Watson. How can we pull out? But if we can't, what do you see coming next? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, the question is, what would America look like if the current trend continues? What would the world look like, Ellen, if the current trend continues? This is the world that I envisage with a fallen America. Terror, tyranny and torture would reign. Individual liberty would be gradually extinguished. Iran would launch a nuclear war against Israel. North Korea would invade South Korea. Indonesia may possibly make a move on Australia. Tyrants in Africa would be emboldened even more than what they already are. Terrorists would have nobody capable of subduing them. In short, complete and total darkness. It's a world that we don't want to contemplate even for a fleeting second. But it's great that you ask the question because it is perhaps the only thing, that prospect is perhaps the only thing that can get Americans back to understanding how important the challenge that they face is. I said earlier that America is the world's greatest value system ever devised for humanity. And it's true. In 5,000 years of recorded human history, we've never seen a country like America. And American values have benefited the world immeasurably. But that value system can only live on if the would-be manufacturers manufacture it and export it. And as I look around in this room, Ellen, you and your fellow students are going to be bequeathed the greatest responsibility in the world to keep the improbable experiment of America alive. And to do so, you need to continue to manufacture and export that value system far and wide. The world depends on it. Well said. Who else, please? Patrick Fitzgerald. Um, I've seen your country from Cairns to Hobart, but I didn't get a feel for its politics. Please characterize uh, conservatism in Australia. How strong is it? <coughs> So that's a wonderful question. Look, Australia is not a centre-right country. Believe it or not, despite everything that you're going through right now, I still happen to believe that America is a centre-right nation. And I say that because culture trumps politics. And the culture of real America, the culture of what I like to consider uh, Main Street America, is one of a conservative nature. It leans, I believe, to the right. When I travel throughout America, I see the ideals of family, faith, flag, and neighborhood. Uh, Australia is more European, is perhaps the best way of describing it to you. We're nowhere near as bad as Europe, but we're certainly not America. And adding to that, the culture of Australia is different to the culture of America. Being a, a brash, bold conservative in Australia doesn't work. We are a people that much prefer to have quiet, small steps towards an objective. And it's perhaps why I'm in America more than I'm in Australia these days, <laughs> because I tend to prefer the uh, hit it out of the park mentality. But Australia is a, is a great country with a great record. I mean, we are so thrilled to be the only country to have fought alongside the United States in every single major conflict since the beginning of last century. And of course, we uh, thank you. <laughs> of course, we hold that distinction because the Brits didn't go to Vietnam. Uh, so Australian politics, look, if you have the political views of Bill O'Reilly in Australia, as an example, you would be considered way out there. That's to give you an indication. Whereas here I find that 
genuine conservative values have a real home and a real place. Uh, I, I believe in Australia they don't. Now a lot of that has to do with demography and a lot of that has to do with the way that our country is, is laid out and I'll give you a little bit of information on that. The perception worldwide internationally about Australia is that we are this land of rugged individualists that uh, fight for ourselves and fend off all kinds of nasty animals and <laughs> some of that's true. But the truth is that there's 23 million of us, so we're a very small country. There are more Californians, there are more Texans than there are Australians. But more importantly, of the 23 million, 16 to 17 million of those 23 live in six of the major cities of Australia. Now, if you compare that to America, and I've done the arithmetic, if you count up all the populations of Chicago and Los Angeles and New York and Dallas and Denver and all of those places, you don't get past the 80 million mark. Now, why is this important? Well, my thesis is that it is demography that often establishes a nation's political psyche. And it's no surprise then that the Australian national sentiment would resemble more that of the inner city. It would come to represent more inner city values as opposed to small towns. Whereas America is really a nation of small towns as opposed to major cities. And that's why, at least up until now, America has always tended to represent on a national level and projected it internationally the values that you would associate with a small town. So I think a lot of that also has to do with the political climate and state of play in Australia. Nice job beginning to learn American slang, Nick. When you said hit it out of the park, I was, thought I was with the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> and we in Colorado don't really like the Boston Red Sox. Hi, I'm Reagan, and I was just wondering if you had an opinion on um, Obama's executive order on immigration. I told you you'd meet interesting people, see? You just met Reagan. I did. <laughs> Reagan, lovely question. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming here with your dad. I believe you guys reached out to me last week and I really appreciate you coming. I'm glad that uh, my work touched you enough for you to come and I'm so happy that it could all work out and you could be here with us tonight. Reagan, it's a really good question. You know, and I had occasion to be in New York for the last couple of weeks and I was able to do lots of media on Fox News about President Obama's amnesty offer. And the simple point I made was that amnesty will always lead to more illegal immigration. If you reward bad behaviour, you're only going to get more bad behaviour. And any high school classroom teacher can tell you that. The only way, <laughs> the only way that you can get people doing the right thing is by being tough, is by enforcing the law, is by enforcing discipline. And President Obama, what he should have said the other week when he gave his big amnesty address was, if you come to America illegally, if you come to America the wrong way, you will never ever get to stay. You will never become an American. We don't want you. We are a caring and compassionate society but we are a nation of laws and things need to happen the right way. And by the way, we're not entirely sure if we really want people coming to our country whose first act is going to be to break the law. That would have sent a very clear message to people aspiring to be illegal immigrants that they would have risked everything for nothing. And that is the only way you can stop illegal immigration. Australia had a dreadful problem with illegal immigration. 
the equivalent of the Democrats got in power back in 2007 and they decided to totally wind back all of the border protection policies that had been in place. What were their reasons? Well, they cited the usual mantra that it was inhumane, it was wrong, it was immoral, we weren't that kind of country. So what happened? Well, the boats started coming. Obviously, Australia is surrounded by water, so the only way to get to Australia illegally is by boat. And the boats started coming. Tens of thousands of people came, thousands of boats, and it was an unmitigated disaster. But more than that, it was a tragedy. More than a thousand people that we just know of perished at sea making that perilous journey. So not only was this soft approach bad policy, goodness knows the types of people that are now in Australia over those four or five year over that four or five year period, but more than that, the policy was so terrible that effectively it cost lives. And the people that wound back those policies had blood on their hands. And it was a conservative government that responded to an uprising of Australians, very unhappy with the situation, that got tough. And what they did, because they couldn't wave a magic wand immediately and stop the boats, first a message had to get out there that there was a new government in place and there was a new policy in place and this is what it was. So in order for that message to go out, of course, in the early months, of the new Conservative government selection, the boats kept coming. So what did the Conservative government do? Well, our Prime Minister came out and said, OK, you have come to Australia illegally. <coughs> Therefore, you will never get to stay. You will never become an Australian. You have two choices. We will either send you home and we will pay for it, or you can go to an offshore processing centre on an island where you will be in detention until which time we manage to process your application. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to tell you that in 11 months, we have not had one single illegal immigrant arrival to Australia. Wow. It is the great story and it is the one that President Obama should be heralding and should be following. But I suspect that there are other motives to his amnesty offer. I note his pledge when he was first elected to fundamentally transform America. Well, make no mistake about it, amnesty will fundamentally <coughs> transform America and it's time for the left to be honest. Populations are on the move everywhere. How many people do we want and how are they going to change our countries? One or two more. Thank you, Mr. Adams, for coming here. My name is Floyd Borokov. As you reflect upon uh, your understanding of American values, I wonder if you can comment on Obama's recent pronounce, uh, pronouncements that racism is uh, deeply rooted and remains deeply rooted in America. Well, I'm not in the South, but I'm going to use some Southern terminology, if it's all right, by Mr. Andrews. <laughs> well, I'm here to tell y'all that it's horse apples. I mean, it's, 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 it's absolute bilge. It is total poppycock. America is the least racist, multiracial society in the world. This country is the best country for any person, including a black person, to live. That's why more black Africans have come to America voluntarily than came as slaves. This is a country that is known for its dedication to e pluribus unum, out of many one. Where in other nations your ethnic heritage or your family's ethnic heritage defines your identity, 
This is a country that is both uninterested and disinterested in where you come from. The only thing that matters is that you're here, that you're in America, that you have in effect signed up to the contract that is the American contract, that you're patriotic, that you're on Team America, and that's all that counts. And one of the gravest threats, I think, to America and American exceptionalism is multiculturalism. We've seen how devastating it is in Europe. We've seen how devastating it is even in America's English-speaking cousins of Australia, England, Canada and New Zealand. And the multiculturalists, I believe, are the true racists because they're the people that think race is so important that they want to emphasise and make a big deal about it. Uh, the last thing a liberal wants is a colourblind society. We want to give everyone a chance to buy Nick's book and shake his hand and have that book autographed. And so, Nick, let me ask you to wrap up by taking us back through your 10-point agenda. A lot of us were very impressed with that when you gave it at the Western Conservative Summit in July, and you went through it so quickly just now. Just walk us through at a little bit more measured pace those 10 points to send us out tonight, please. Yes, sir. Number one, end the waste. Number two, pay back the debt. Number three, limit the government. Number four, axe political correctness. Number five, too fast? Let's start again. Number one, end the waste. Number two, pay back the debt. Number three, limit the government. Number four, axe political correctness. Number five, protect the borders. Number six, preserve Judeo-Christian traditions. Number seven, end the culture of entitlement. Number eight, cut taxes. Number nine, exercise fidelity to the Constitution. And number 10, keep the peace through unquestioned military advantage. Thank goodness, I thought I was gonna have a Rick Perry moment now there. Take, take the last word, go ahead and give, give him the wrap up. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, again, a wonderful pleasure, honor and privilege to be here with you tonight. Uh, as a young man, I dreamed of being able to come here and speak to audiences just like you and to have C-SPAN here is a particular treat to have this broadcast right across the country. Uh, I believe that I have an invaluable contribution to make to American life and society. I hope I'll be able to make that as an American in the future. That's my dream. That's what I'd like to do. And uh, I encourage each and every single one of you to keep in touch, to be familiar with my work and to help me in whatever way you can. I'd really appreciate it. God bless you and never let anyone tell you that you don't live in the greatest country in the history of the world. <laughs>